everyone. And thank you for joining us today, yesterday, on Wednesday, around all these layers regarding the very sensitive and crucial issue of mental health. Today, and here especially, we will address an issue that's of great importance to us all, an issue that has profound effect on society, the ongoing challenge of gun violence, and of course its impact on young people. Despite gun violence being often associated with the United States, it's essential to recognize that this is a global issue. In a world increasingly connected and influenced by shared cultures and media, the normalization of violence is not confined to one country's borders. The impact echoes globally, contributing to a more aggressive social narratives and sadly changing how we perceive and respond to conflict and disagreement. A gun violence incident in one part of the world can reverberate in countless others, triggering traumatic responses and causing a ripple effect that can touch any of us anywhere. The fight against normalization of violence, therefore, is not just a national concern, but a global imperative. We must come together as a global community to ensure the safety and well-being of our young generations and actually foster a world where peace and respect are the norm and not the exemption. We are privileged to have a stellar lineup of speakers who will enlighten us with their insights. Nicole Hockley, co-founder and CEO of the Sandy Hook Promise Foundation, turned the personal tragedy into a force for change. Dr. Cornelia Kriegs, a pediatric surgeon and critical care specialist at Harvard Medical School. David Hawke, a survivor of gun violence, who is now co-founder of March for Our Lives. Marjorie Morrison, co-founder of PsychHub, focuses on mental health solutions and the power of education to break down barriers. Nicoletta Neranzis, founder and executive director of Run for Fun, and Duane Dieter, founder, with, uh, founder excuse me, and president of Hero Community Program and Close Quarters Defense, will also join the discussion. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speakers. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you so much to SNF Nostos for this opportunity. We're super excited to share this conversation with you and to hear your questions. Um, today, we're going to talk about the normalization of violence and its impact on the mental health and wellness of young people. But before I introduce my esteemed panelists and before we get into the discussion, I just wanted to do a little bit of framing about what we are going to talk about and what we're not going to talk about. So it's not going to surprise anyone here when I say that America has a problem with gun violence. We are a country with more guns than people, a country where some people advocate that we need even more guns in order to be safe. And yet we're a country that's already had 318 mass shootings this year alone, an average of two mass shootings every day in which four or more people are killed or injured. This past weekend alone, we had 17 mass shootings in 10 different states across the country. America ranks first when it comes to firearm deaths when compared to other high-income, high-population countries. And you can see here the difference with Greece, which is number six on this list. However, considering the population size difference between America and Greece, this is around 14,000 homicides, and that's not counting suicides, which account for two-thirds of gun violence deaths. That's about 14,000 homicide deaths by firearm in the U.S. compared to 37 in Greece. We have a real problem. And yet, we keep producing more guns. This, is, this shows how many guns have been produced in the U.S. market over the last several years. At current count, it's about 465 million. 
that have been produced, and that is for the U.S. market. That does not include the firearms that we export, and it does not include the firearms that we produce for the military. It does include firearms produced for law enforcement, but that's only about one million out of that 465 million. And if you think about how durable firearms are, and even counting for natural attrition and breakage and seizures, there's probably at least still 350 million guns in circulation within the U.S. right now. So do more guns make us safer? Some people certainly claim that they do. It may make some people feel safer to have a gun for self-protection. Yet there was a study not too long ago that showed that for self-protection, less than 1% of crimes use firearms for self-protection. And even then, they're more often to end up with the person being injured or killed. And if you have a firearm in the home, there is significant evidence to show that you are more likely to be a victim or to have someone die in your home, um, especially someone who has inappropriate access to that firearm. So do more guns make us safer? Absolutely not. And as you can see here, as we continue to manufacture more guns, the correlating number of gun violence is also increasing. So, like I said, we have a problem. Yet in the face of this escalating violence, we seem to be unable to find a way to prevent this public health epidemic. Even when 50,000 people were killed last year alone in the United States. Even when gun violence is now the number one cause of death for children under the age of 19. Even when polls show that the majority of Americans, including the majority of gun owners, do want sensible gun safety regulations. <coughs> Even when we have children in their kindergarten classes practicing active shooter drills, and we have international travel advisories warning other countries about the danger of coming to the U.S. And yet, in the face of this escalating violence, we aren't stopping it. We know that no matter where we are, whether it's our house of worship, our supermarket, our mall, our movie theater, walking down the street, the very real threat of gun violence is ever-present. Now, some people say that their Second Amendment right is more important than the need to regulate firearms. Like some of my panelists here, I've spent a lot of time with gun, over, gun owners over the last 10 years, and most of them are very reasonable, sensible people that are still trying to figure out how to bring their voice to this conversation. But there are some extremists, and the number of times I've heard someone say, the Second Amendment is my God-given right, my response is, God had nothing to do with this. This is your constitutional right, and it's a right that was written by white men for white men over 230 years ago in a place that has no bearing in the modern interpretation of the Second Amendment in terms of the firearms that are now available or the modern stressors that are facing young people and adults. Guns are an intrinsic part of our culture. It's in our everyday language, in our lexicon. It's in our popular culture, in the movies and the TV shows that we watch. It's in our social media. It's in the games we play. And it's even in our advertising. I was recently involved in a suit against a, a lawsuit against a gun manufacturer. And some of the ads that they were placing at that time were showing things like, if you want to be a man, you need to have an AR-15. You know your friend Jeffrey? He likes romantic comedies. He's a crier. Send us his email address, and we'll tell him how to buy an AR-15 so that he can become a real man, too. This is what we're facing in our country. And yet, we're still not doing enough. It's part of our culture, and it's killing us. And this situation is even more dire in communities of color. Black and Hispanic Americans make up less than one-third of the U.S. population, and yet make up three-quarters of gun homicides. This is every day in America. It has become part of our normal, and for the most part, we've let it be that way. We've let it be that way because of our partisan politics, our fear, and our inability to have an honest, informed, and civil discussion about ways that we can prevent it. There has been progress, but it's slow. And some people are losing hope. They feel hopeless and helpless because of the 
slow pace of change. And yet that apathy, that helplessness, is further hindering progress. So some people say that this is the price to pay for living in America today. Well, I say for a country that claims itself to be the land of the free and the home of the brave, we are neither free nor brave when it comes to gun violence. So that's a little bit of framing about guns. And now we're not really going to talk about guns anymore. What we're going to talk about instead is what does this mean to our population? And most importantly, how has this impacted our most precious citizens, our young people? This is the generation that has grown up with gun violence, that has experienced the normalization of this violence. So we're going to talk about their experience, but we're not going to leave you in a dark place because we're really going to focus today on the youth-centered solutions that can help fight against this normalization of violence. So I'm going to start now by introducing our panelists, or really allowing them to introduce themselves and talk about what lens they're bringing to this conversation and the impact their organizations have had. Marjorie, let's start with you. Well, thank you, Nicole, for that really um, sobering uh, introduction. And you did it, articulated it in such a good way. I also have to thank the SNF, the whole foundation. I have been in mental health my whole life. I, right out of college, I went in graduate school for psychology, but my father was a psychiatrist, so I'm claiming my whole life of in mental health. And to see the global focus and attention is amazing. So I just, it is like as daunting as these conversations and as hard as they are to have, I'm so grateful for all of you for taking the time and showing up and being vulnerable and sharing because that's kind of what it's going to take. Um, I spent, I run Psych Hub, which is a mental health education and now connection platform. I spent about a decade of my career in private practice and I would say that like most mental health providers, I was a generalist, came out of school just with a theoretical orientation, but not really any kind of evidence-based, here's how you treat things. Most people don't realize that. That is how most of us are trained. And so I treated everybody the same, whether they had ADHD or eating disorder or anxiety or insomnia or complicated grief. But we now know today there are different ways to treat all of these different interventions, and that's what evidence-based is. So I got an opportunity to go work with the military in the U.S. I spent about a decade working with our Marines, got an opportunity to develop and implement a mandatory proactive counseling program because I quickly learned that they weren't coming in because of stigma. And um, so we figured, why not bring it to them? And I had an amazing time doing that. I started a nonprofit educating um, everyday civilians on how to treat, um, how to work with veterans. So super important in the US, we only have 1% of our country serving, about 10% military connected. So 90% of us don't really know that population anymore. It's different in some countries like Israel where everyone serves. So we did a lot of training on that and then um, started Psych Hub. Um, which is really about how do we train everybody in the ecosystem on mental health literacy so that everybody is educated from each one of you from every lens. Um, and so we'll talk about a little bit more about how we go about training and all different things. So I'm honored to be here and I'll come from the lens of training and education. I'm David Hogg. I'm a uh, former student from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Um, on February 14th of 2018, there were 17 of my classmates and administrators that were murdered at my high school by a 19-year-old gunman with an AR-15 that was legally obtained, and he continued to legally own that weapon despite making multiple threats against my high school and being reported to the FBI multiple times. Um, after the shooting, a group of students and myself uh, came together on a classmate's living room floor, and we decided to start an organization um, focused on mobilizing young people to turn out and vote in order to take down uh, what we perceive to be the obstacle to implementing what the majority of Americans want, which are stronger gun laws, and um, taking down the organization uh, known as the National Rifle Association and the Gun Lobby that represents the most extreme views of gun owners and not the, the, what the vast majority, like my father, believe. Um, 
From that, we mobilized thousands of students around the country. We had millions of students walk out of their high schools a month after the shooting, uh, protesting in the inaction on gun violence. Um, we had millions of people march with us a uh, month and a half after the shooting, about 800,000 marched with us in DC. And on every continent that doesn't have penguins, we had marches. Um, and we since have helped change the conversation on young people voting in the United States. Um, after the Parkland shooting, people said to us, you know, it's great you guys care, but you don't vote, so it doesn't really matter, nothing's gonna change. This, you know, it's great you care that you wanna, that you wanna change gun laws here in Florida, but it, this is Florida, things don't change here. And we said, okay, watch us. And we went to our Republican-led state legislature and changed gun laws. Mind you, laws that even Governor Ron DeSantis has not been able to repeal, despite having a supermajority in the state legislature. Since then, the laws that we've passed. <laughs> I could go on and on about the amazing stuff the young people have done in our country, because um, we clearly need it. Um, but the last thing I'll say is we just recently got the first piece of federal gun legislation passed in 30 years. Um, known as the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that helped fund mental health programs in schools and communities and also help create a more stringent background check process for people buying uh, rifles under the age of 21. So. Thanks, David. Thanks so much for having me today. My name is Dr. Cornelia Griggs. I'm a pediatric surgeon, trauma critical care specialist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and assistant professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. Um, I became activated in this work because when a child or teenager is shot, I am one of the doctors waiting in the trauma bay in the emergency room to receive them. And I have become sick and frustrated and exhausted with having the conversation with mothers in the trauma bay and having to tell them that we were not able to save their baby's life and that their child had died senselessly and needlessly at the hands of gun violence. And so as part of that work, I'm the director of education at the Massachusetts General Center for Gun Violence Prevention. And at our center, we focus on how doctors, nurses, health, professionals and public health professionals can work harder to fight the problem of gun violence in our country and how we can activate healthcare workers to be a part of the solution. Thank you. Um, and for those who don't know, my name is Nicole Hockley. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sandy Hook Promise, an organization, a national nonprofit that I helped launch uh, one month after the shooting and, and killing of my youngest son, Dylan, at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Uh, and in the last 10 years, we have very much focused on legislation, similar um, to March for Our Lives and, and David's organization, and have been very successful at a state and federal level, now passing four federal laws in three different presidential administrations. Um, but really, our focus is on teaching youth. How do you recognize the warning signs of someone who could be in crisis and potentially gonna hurt themselves or someone else and take action? Um, and to date, our evidence is very strong that our programs, which are provided at, for, at no charge to schools across the country, we've trained over 21 million youth so far in 23,000 schools, um, have had thousands of mental health interventions, over 400 direct suicide uh, aversion, um, prevented directly over 400 youth suicides, and 15 credible planned school shooting plots that law enforcement have uh, confirmed. So um, we're making a difference, but we still have a long way to go. So when we think about young people and how we identify those who need help, I'm going to start off with you, Cornelia. So there's a lot of new tools that can help, such as adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and strength-based approaches like benevolent childhood experiences. And these are important tools for early evaluation of a child's likelihood of engaging in an act of violence or self-harm, often based on the trauma and exposure to violence that they've already had. Could you tell us more about these approaches and how you see these working together in practice to best help young people and their families? Absolutely. Um, so we know that adverse childhood experiences and exposure to gun violence and certainly witnessing gun violence or being the victim of gun violence is a major adverse childhood experience. And we know that these are independent predictors of uh, mental health disease, other struggles into adulthood, difficulty obtaining stable housing, jobs, et cetera. 
and they're a major contributor to the disease burden, not only for mental health, but physical disease later in life as well. Um, we know that over 60% of American adults uh, report at least one adverse childhood experience, and this is not a US-centric problem necessarily, um, but uh, nearly 25% of adults report more than four um, adverse childhood experiences. And there is a growing body of literature um, that is trying to understand exactly how these adverse childhood experiences play out later in life in terms of health. We know that if we were to reduce the number of adverse childhood experiences by just 10%, that would result in annually $56 billion of savings in healthcare expenses alone. Um, and if we were to prevent adverse childhood experiences, we could prevent 21 million cases of depression. Um, so there's an emerging body of literature looking at benevolent childhood experiences, love, support, stability, safety, and how these can act as a protective factor against adverse childhood experiences. And again, we know that exposure to gun violence qualifies independently as an adverse childhood experience. And what we're seeing is that independent of socioeconomic status, benevolent childhood experiences can play a protective role in a child's life, and that results in numerous benefits to their health later on in life. Um, but while these benevolent childhood experiences can have a protective effect, um, there are studies that show they are still outweighed by adverse childhood experiences. So we can mitigate the effects of adverse childhood experiences through benevolent benevolent childhood experiences, but we can't prevent all the downstream effects and harm of adverse childhood experiences alone. Thank you for that. Um, Marjorie, thinking about um, perhaps benevolent childhood experiences as well, there's a lot of work that experts can do to help support young people, but what about the non-experts? What about just the everyday people like you and me? How can trusted adults best ally with young people to support their mental health and wellness? It's such a great question. It's like when we started Psych Hub, we went right into, as I mentioned, training mental health practitioners on evidence-based practice, like upskilling them, because that just felt like there was a real need, because when you do that, everyone wins, right? Your client, get better care in fewer sessions, there's less burnout for the provider, and there's a total cost of care savings, kind of what you had mentioned. But once we got into it, we're about four and a half years old now, we realized really quickly that not everybody's going to show up in a mental health practitioner's office, and not everybody needs to show up there. And we started to really look at, so how do we train an entire ecosystem, right, on what to do to be there? I'm just curious, by a show of hands, how many of you have been in a situation where someone has come to you with some mental health needs and you felt like you needed to help them? All right, so pretty much all of you. So that means we all are part of the solution. And we all need to get educated on what to say and what to do during critical times. And so I'd say for one, there's trainings. Of course, I run a company that has a mental health ally training where what we do with that is we take courses and we teach you about understanding suicidal ideation, understanding what to do, safety planning, what do you say and do when someone might be suicidal, understanding competency, understanding diversity, right? What unconscious bias, we all have it, do we bring to the table when we're having conversations with people? What to do in a crisis? We teach motivational interviewing, an easy framework of how to talk to people, but, and we're really good at it, and we have different verticals of it too, but no matter what, in those moments, we still tend to forget what we learn, um, especially if it's like you take the courses and you get certified and now it's a year later and something happened. And so we also had to learn that you had to reach people in those moments of, of in those moments right there of need. So we've also created hundreds and hundreds of short targeted videos. And um, we're honored to be YouTube's partner for mental health. So good chance if you go on YouTube and you put a mental health topic in there, a psych hub video is gonna show up. But it's all really important because there's an algorithm that we have that can help you if it's like, what is an eating disorder? We pretty much know you're also then gonna to wanna to see what is anorexia and then how to treat someone with anorexia. And, um, and I, I say 
I say all of that, and I got an opportunity to talk to Nicole about even the, the shooter of Sandy Hook that they think had a, an eating disorder. Education is key because I can't even imagine what David has gone through, what Nicole has gone through, or what Cornelius have, what these three people have gone through. I won't even pretend, but I'm going to guess that most of them have heard that the person, the perpetrator, people knew. Someone had an idea. Someone saw. So we all can be part of that solution of knowing what to do and say and get people on that help early. Absolutely. 100% agree. Um, David, one of the themes that I've heard at quite a few of the um, panels at this conference is about the power of young people and the need to give them more personal agency and control. And as one of the founders of the largest youth movement within the gun violence movement, how do you best help students from all ages, elementary school to college, to advocate for their voices and advocate for the changes they want? And also, considering how much young people have on their plates, how do you keep them engaged when the progress on this is so slow? That's a really good question. Um, I think one of the key ways that we keep young people engaged is knowing that um, you know, young people are busy. They can't do this 24-7, and that's okay. And giving them, you know, the agency to feel that the permit, you know, the permission that I think a lot of activists and young organizers feel like they need, even though it really should just be given by themselves, to know that they can't, they can step away. And it doesn't mean that you're hurting the movement or you're acting selfishly. It means that you're acting selflessly, and that movements have to take care of themselves too. So in March for Our Lives, many of the co-founders have have left and gone on to, you know, study theater in college, and that's okay, right? I think understanding that joy is a part of, is a form of resistance is really important because one of the, one of the most sinister things that I think a lot of the critics of the young people after Parkland, um, the young people who stood up after Parkland did, was they would make memes of us that said, you know, they would take photos that were taken out of context where you know, a TV producer, after we did an interview, would say, wow, you guys are really inspirational to me. Can I have a photo with you? And you naturally smile on that photo, right? They would take those and they would say, this is the face that you make when all of your classmates have been dead and you're standing on their dead bodies. Right? They tried to take our joy from us and say, because of what we went through, because of what we're saying, we can't be happy anymore. And it took a lot of work for myself personally, and I'm, I know for other students in, in March, to know that joy is a form of resistance. And that th those people that are out there, the reason they're saying that is because they don't want us to believe that it's possible to end this. Yeah. They want to kill any hope that we have that it doesn't have to be this way. And the most critical thing that I think March has learned to instill in our young people is that as we're doing this work, we have to be proactive about our, our self-care and our mental health and our community health. And a good example of this is when we were in Uvalde around this time last year. Some of the parents from Uvalde asked students from Parkland, myself and my friend Sam Fuentes, who still has shrapnel in her body to this day from the shooting, to come out and talk to some of the, the siblings and the parents in Uvalde. And that day we participated in a protest with them demanding accountability from the police department where there were several hundred police officers and law enforcement officers outside of the school that did absolutely nothing to stop the gunmen, right? Demanding accountability from them. And we marched around with them for several hours in the Texas heat. And normally after that, what we would do in March for Our Lives historically is we would just go back to our hotel rooms at night and just stare up at the ceiling and be depressed and be sad and be, be alone. But what I've learned to do in March for Our Lives having experienced a lot of that burnout myself, is I said, all right, guys, because I know that if we only associate each other with incredibly traumatic and exhausting experiences like this, talking to parents that have gone through literally the worst thing imaginable, mm -hmm. if we don't learn to positively associate being around each other with something else as well to help negate that negative, that awful experience, obviously, we're gonna to come to turn on each other. We're gonna think that we are the problem, that other student activists are the problem. So what we do, what, what, what I said we're gonna do that night, is I said, okay guys, I know today has been like a really tiring day, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna go get Mexican food because we're right next to the Mexican border. 
and we're going to go out 30 minutes outside of town into the desert and just stargaze and not talk about any of this. And just have that moment of peace to just calm down and associate each other with that and talk about the stars and space, you know, and life. And I know in the past, my past self would have been very critical of that and said, you know, that's stupid, that's meaningless. But I think that's one of the most important things that we do now in March is being proactive about that and not re-traumatizing the students that are already often themselves are survivors of gun violence. So learning to proactively take care of ourselves is I think the way that we've done that and giving people permission to know that they can step away. You know, I've had to take a step back when I, were, when I was in college. I've taken several months off, six months off at a time before because I know the work isn't all on me because I know you're out there, Nicole, doing the work when I can't be. And you know that I'm out here and the young people of March for Our Lives are doing the work and it's not on any single one of us. And I think that is the most important lesson that we teach our young people in the organization. I, I love that and it resonates so strongly because um, I still see in my 18-year-old son who survived Sandy Hook School, he was eight, um, how to express joy can be a problem. And I know with my label as a Sandy Hook mom, you know, being criticized for smiling, being criticized for laughing out loud, and it was years before I allowed to, myself to dance in public again because I thought people think I'm supposed to be grieving 24-7, which I am, but you still need to find joy in life as well, um, especially for those who survive, um, without a doubt. So thank you for that. Um, Cornelia, I'm going to come back to you now um, because there are so many of us working to support mental health, to support young people, to, to help them advocate and to be well. And we all know that, you know, first of all, medical professionals are dealing with the acute um, causes and effects of gun violence, but you're also seeing the long-term mental health impacts on young people as well. So just thinking about how can the medical profession, and that's everyone from those that are in the schools through to those that are in the community and practitioners, how can they help prevent more of this from happening? Absolutely. Well, I think there are three things that doctors and healthcare professionals can do um, to intervene to prevent gun violence. Um, and the first is to screen our patients for access to firearms. And that's something we're working very aggressively in the Center for Gun Violence Prevention. Um, the second thing is if you get a positive screen, we have to be comfortable and confident talking to our patients about the safe use of those firearms and safe storage of those firearms. And third, we have to feel activated to thwart harm in instances when we feel that it is imminent. And the problem with that is over 75% of medical trainees report absolutely zero training or exposure to any tools or education to be able to do any of those three things. Um, and that's something that we have innovated at the Massachusetts um, Center for Gun Violence. We have developed a novel curriculum for healthcare workers, physicians, nurses, all levels of healthcare professionals to develop comfort confidence and to feel empowered to not only screen their patients for access to firearms, but then to intervene and give them tools to use and store those firearms safely. And to feel empowered to know what laws are available in their state and how to use those laws when they feel that there's imminent harm. Um, and I also want to piggyback on what you and David just said about the importance of joy. I think one of the central roles for um, the public health community and healthcare professionals um, is that we have to join the conversation and we have to be empowered as credible messengers. Um, and I think it's really important, I'm gonna quote Michael Dowling, who is the CEO of one of the largest healthcare networks in New York, who recently convened a CEO's council of hospitals around the country. And he had a great quote, he said, we have to give oxygen to hope. And I think that plays nicely on what you and David are saying about joy. We have to give people reason to believe that they don't have to accept the current levels of gun violence in our country and that they themselves can all be agents of change. Hope is what feeds so many of us in so many ways. And, and Marjorie, thinking about hope, it's one thing to provide excellent resources. It's one thing to give hope. But how do you combat the fact that some there's still stigma around reaching out for mental health resources sometimes, and how do we improve access, especially 
for young people where perhaps certain age ranges have more stigma at attached to getting help than others or certain cultures. How, how, how do we go about fixing that? You know, it's interesting. What I've learned is that those are issues globally, where when we talk about gun violence, um, that is, you know, seems a lot more prevalent right now in the US, <coughs> but stigma and access to care seems consistent from wherever I go and talk to people from, from countries all over. And, you know, the system is not set up well. Um, we've been set up to have mental health be separate from physical health. I see it says on here, founder. I'm actually co-founder of Psychev. I co-founded it with Patrick Kennedy, who spoke yesterday. So I can't give him a little credit. But, you know, he talks a lot about how from the very beginning we separated out mental health. And so it makes it a harder to go see it, but we know mental health is a part of everything. I mean, everyone here I know, we're all of like minds because we've been listening to all of these talks, right? So I believe that stigma is getting better. I think that, you know, cultures are changing. I had an opportunity to do a masterclass in Dubai a few months ago, and I had people from all different regions um, and I, all different Arab reason, regions and learned a lot about even how stigma is starting to get, you know, go away there and people are looking for care and trying to find ways to care and some of these, you know, ethnic and religious groups that would go against it. So we now have, a, I think, a different problem where people are accessing and looking for care for the first time. People are coming out, they're sharing their diagnoses. It's, we've created all the youth, all the work that's been done to make it okay to not be okay. Well, now we have a whole bunch of people looking for care and it's hard to find it. So it's a hard problem to solve and a, and a complicated solution and I'm not gonna pretend that I have it all figured out. But if you think about it like a triangle, we wanna leave our psychiatrists at the very top for the people that really need medication and we wanna start to bring out those licensed psychologists specialized as we start moving. I'm incredibly optimistic as we get towards more of the lower acuity um, that a lot of this great technology is coming out, new apps, digital therapies, and we've learned about some of them here. Some people can do a self-guided um, therapy session on their phone, and the outcomes can look really good. The peer movement is really exciting. Uh, the evidence is looking good that people tend to benefit and react to people just like them. The coaches, we have a whole movement going on in the U.S. about elevating coaches to do, to fill in some of this mental health. We're part of a project for pharmacists that they can start doing some low, lower acuity, more kind of generalized depression, anxiety, less complicated issues. So it's a disorganized system, right? So we have to get people in to that right kind of level of care. We have to educate, we're all consumers of mental health, so we all need to be educated. What is right for us? And by the way, what's right for you today might be different than what you need a, in a year. So it's fluid, and then we need to connect people who are looking for care for the right resources for them. And I can tell you that, you know, we've, we have launched Psych Hub Connect a couple months ago, it hasn't had its public launch, but we partnered with Google, we partnered with many of our insurance companies in the US, and um, it is really amazing how we are able to say to an insurance company, this is the US way of tackling it, where do you wanna see your members go? And then use technology to educate them on one side and connect them. So it's fragmented, it needs work. I think every country, especially if it's socialized medicine, I talked to some people in, in Greece last night and they were sharing with me, it's really private pay primarily here, and that's a problem because A, we're, cut, we're ruling out people who can't afford it, and there is no evidence to show that private pay gives you better therapy than if you're using what's covered. So, different, different answer for every, yeah. probably, country, but all in all, there's a framework out there. Fabulous. Before we move to our two uh, interventions who are gonna add their experience to this as well, we've, had, we've heard a lot from our panel of adults here and I wanted to make sure that we were hearing, no disrespect to you, David, to young people as well. So we've compiled a short video to talk about, for here from youth, what do they think about the normalization of violence and what gives them hope? 
you always hear stories on the news of other people and other incidents and other acts of violence and you're left wondering, will I be next? I'm scared to go to school because I don't know when something is gonna happen. There's times where I know like myself and other people would even just skip school when we hear that there's a threat going around. Particularly for me, with the amount of gun violence that has happened in the US lately, it's definitely changed my view of the world in such a way that I've become a lot more pessimistic um, about how I see the world around me. It's changed the way that I do certain things in my daily life. It's really caused me to be a lot more careful about what I do, careful about my surroundings. It's become such a normal part of day-to-day -day life here. I feel like especially as a student, seeing things in the news of like shootings in schools and grocery shops, like everywhere I go, I really have to be careful of everything around me, which is a really scary thought. And I feel like places that I used to feel safe at, like school or just going out, walking my dog, something like that. Now seeing all of this in the news, it just makes me really scared going basically everywhere because you have to be so aware because these things can happen anywhere. We're not supposed to be feeling this way. This is not supposed to be normalized. And I fear that like as these headlines come, people will become more desensitized and think this is normal. This is not normal. What gives me hope for the future is knowing that there are students and there are young people that really want to change the world and they really want to help solve this issue that is gun violence in the U.S. Um, I think we've reached a point in our generation that we are kind of fed up with everything that's happening around us. I think, you know, usually in the past it was like, oh, you're too young or you don't know what you're talking about. But in the wake of such violence, we have a generation that has risen up and has decided to say, no, we're not going to deal with this. We're not going to be silenced. We have a generation that is choosing to protest. We might be young, but that doesn't mean that our voice is any lesser. Um, and that is something that truly gives me hope in the world. I feel like the thing that gives me the most hope for the future is definitely the community at Sandy Hook Promise, because seeing all the work that I do and everyone else does here, it gives me hope because there's so many other people that are passionate about creating a change. And I feel like every time something happens, even if there's nothing going on, there's still people that are advocating um, to fight against gun violence and things like that. And I think it's just really so hopeful to see the youth in this generation so passionate about creating a change. We have the ability to prevent school shootings, but we can't do it without the help of adults. Um, we can't do it without the help of higher authorities. And hopefully us rallying together, the youth rallying together, authorities will see that this is not an issue to be taken lightly. This is not about, this is not have nothing have to do with politics. This is a right to live to our fullest potential, right to just grow through all our phases of life. Absolutely, um, true words. Um, I'd like to turn over now to two of our experts. We're gonna start off with Dwayne Dieter, who is founder and president of the HERO Community Program. So Dwayne, we'd love to hear from you additional ways that we can help young people go co grow confidence and skills to respond to difficult situations. And also about your program, how do you select the mentors for integration into your program? Good afternoon, everyone. Thrilled to be here. It's so great to be around so many wonderful people with the focus of mental ability and control and mental health. Within today, we understand the difficulty of all youth. It's a constant struggle to understand of the positive and negative things that are given to them, the influences around all their children at all times. With a program, we first start with giving them the truth. It's the only way to go. It's the facts of if you are positive, you will have a greater chance of success. It doesn't mean it's guaranteed, but it does mean it's the greatest path. On the same hand, we must also tell them the truth about the difficulty that they may face. That there is negativity in the world and the only way they can withstand that is to be empowered and understand it exists. That struggle that happens between a person and a person's friends on dealing with how do we manage that, how do we decide which way to go is what builds the great confidence that they may have in life or in fact may have them turn to have more struggles. We all know in this room that our positivity and our growth has happened many times from bad things happening. The things we're hearing from the panelists has come from a bad thing. But because of that, they've made great changes. We know in our personal life, the harder the problem, the harder the challenge, the greater we have an opportunity to be, to be stronger, to be better. 
We call the term, this process, life is a fight. Not the physical fight, that is not as important as the internal fight. What allows us to succeed under those struggling, difficult times. To push our mind, body, and spirit to focus so heavily that we will not be trapped in something that will have us be defeated, but to actually push us to uh, better and higher values. We do this through many processes. We understand that with kids, including myself and all of you, that we love and are thrilled at excitement. So the excitable person, the person that is most focused on that upper edge, and all of you that have children and, and see in the community, those persons that are excited are thrilled by it. They love the challenge. They love that feeling of excitement and want to participate. That goes two ways, though. The one way is all good. It's personal growth and it's accomplishment. And that's what happens with this level of excitement. The other part, though, is the part that excitement can be the allure of following criminality. It can be the allure of following difficult or problematic personalities, or a person that may push them into insecurities or doing the wrong thing or having bad behavior, or in fact, pushing them to feel lesser about themselves. How we approach this is by teaching them both sides of the equation and by putting them in realistic situations that they feel. So yes, we train them up, we train them with our mentors, which we'll talk about in a minute, but we give them those capabilities to know that this exposure that they feel, that feels so bad when it happens, actually, we want you to feel it before it happens. And when you feel it before it happens and you actually see it again, that exposure makes you understand it's not so tough. It's pretty easy when you think of it on that process. So we get them parts in rooms and in other areas where they are able to meet these role players. And these role players are very good from all ages of life, of all descriptions, and each one of them will bring about some of the difficulties that they'll face, naysayers, negative actions towards them or others, persons that are pushing them in the wrong direction, uh, persons that are intimidators, we all have had that in our life, and they get to feel and experience that, that really, they have no power. They all, all of us thought that in life when we were coming up, that they had this great power, but actually, they're just insecure. They don't have the abilities, they just know that they want to pick and push on the persons that they could affect. Now, at the same time, they go into rooms of various places and are encouraged and are positively built to where they feel good about what they've done. And when they stand up, it's seen by the little guardian heroes we have with them. And they're encouraged for that. They also then are empowered by doing one of the hardest things there is, which is moral courage. If everyone had the moral courage, it would be a much easier world. That means when you see something wrong, you stand up. As in the cases happened throughout all the schools, many people did hear of those things. That person said they were going to hurt somebody or do something bad. Sometimes the students stood up and said, teacher, we think this is going to happen. And maybe they listened or maybe they did li not listen. But in most occasions, these aspects of moral empowerment and courage is the toughest to bolster. It's the most difficult for us. Telling on a person's not doing it right. That's saying bad things about another. Standing up for a person who's being ridiculed or pushed. Leave that person alone. Being able to stand up is the hardest of all aspects. So we have those abilities too. Where they go into the room, they see someone, they have to cheer up. They have to help them, and they have to figure out. We actually have it to where they are involved with adults. Where a little kid, a young youth, and different ages come into an adult having trouble. You would be surprised how much they learn from you adults when they are in the adult shoes helping someone else. It empowers them. After that process becomes the validation. There is stress here, as all things that are really good have stress in it. There's a good stress and a bad stress. When you're doing something that is good, the stressors allow you to do better. That's the stress we use because they see the purpose behind it and what it means for them as a person and how that will make them stronger and better. This validation happens very fast. From one minute, they're kind of attacked a little bit verbally. The next minute, they're being bullied. The next minute, they're helping someone else. And in that way, their mind goes to a higher state, a state that encapsulates fast mental reaction to see in half a second what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do, and they can make those actions very quickly. All of this program started because of an event that happened to me when I was on the DEA task force, Drug Enforcement Task Force, in my state of Maryland. 
while we arrested a kingpin doing 15 kilos of crack a week, which was pretty severe in that area in ruin to hurt our area for many years past, we had not found their cars. Finally, we got the car of the person who was in prison for three months. As I get his car and go back to the police station just to pass it off, I was going at 10 o'clock at night, darks, the windows are dark, and as I see a crowd of people and they're all waving at me. So I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. As I put the window down and listened carefully, they were actually shouting and chanting his name, the kingpin drug dealer that had hurt so many. I sat in awe, counted almost 70 people, of how could that be? Now maybe you all have that issue where you go home and they're all cheering at you when you get up and come into your town, but I've not had it once. So it broke me, that moment it broke me. At that moment I thought that if I was that child on that street, there is no doubt that I would be that way. I would probably not be the person who was less excited that may just go to a restaurant to learn to develop some money to go to the college. I would see this guy that had the hot cars, the money, the fame, full dominance and capabilities to do what, they really, what he really wanted. That would have drawn my attention. Those of you know kids that maybe not be not drawn that way, and others you know would have gone directly that way. That dominant personality of power is very significant. So because of that, that's what started the program. I just started hanging in the street with the kids for no other reason, not about law enforcement, not about anything else. As I got to learn the kids and the families and their families, I saw that all of them did not wish to have this happen to them. Then by knowing people, and going to various events, I introduced them to as many people as I could that were exciting. That's the key to our program, is excitement. In your eyes, in your ability, and your purpose shows in your work. So as I started introducing them to those kids, very quickly I found that they would go that way and stimulate that way. As it occurred, and as they go through the training, we do special missions where they go save people in trouble, helicopter follows them out, male, female, doesn't matter who they are, it empowers them to know that they can do something. Then we trigger it to what persons can we bring them to to allow them to succeed the best way we possibly can. Once they get the confidence, it becomes easy. What better way or what better time spent is it to defend your ability to be happy for these kids? Stress makes them drop, unless it makes them rise. Within all this, the stressors that we put on them is to help them succeed and do better. And through that process, they find it's easier. It wards off these things away from them where they no longer have that problem anymore because the little bad negative elements are very good at finding people who they can scare. When they don't see that fear, they don't mess with them anymore. How we pick and work with the integration of our support is because we train many military police and first responders, they're heroes in their own right. So they have that energy, that, that energy. A lot of kids like that. But it doesn't matter. We train everyone from all professionals. It doesn't matter if they're a doctor, accountant, worker of any description. As long as they have and are clear in their mind, have a good purpose for what their life is, whatever that wants to be, the kids see it. We bring them in, we train them. That's how we vet them, because we put them through the same things we do the kids. After that, they then go through specialized mentor training, and they become part of the program. Thank you. So I'd like to bring to the stage now Nicoletta Narengis, who is the founder and executive director of Run for Fun. So Nicoletta, based on your experience, how can we effectively address and mitigate the mental health trauma experienced by children and adolescents exposed to gun violence through trauma-informed socio-emotional youth development programming, incorporating physical activity, and what precautions should communities take? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the SNF NOSTIS team. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to my esteemed panel. Uh, mental health um, is, uh, um, means the world to me. Uh, I founded Run for Fun. Uh, my son had a lot of anxiety around competition and school. And he, um, I said, why don't you join a soccer team or a, a basketball team? Um, but he said he just had a lot of anxiety. He said, um, so we went on a run one day, he loved to run and play. We closed down the, the playgrounds every day. And I said, Paniotti, why don't you join a running program, running club? He said, no, mama, but if you do it, I, I'll do it. So I took him and six friends, and we went to the park, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, 
and played running games, and I packed them in my car around the city. And, um, and today we, we serve over 2,000 young people in New York City. Um, there are countless stories and experiences of young people throughout New York that speak volumes to the healing power of physical activity to mitigate trauma. Young people like Gus, who had tremendous anxiety around school and recess, discovered his love of running with me during recess. He raced to school on days when he could run laps, and his friends would jump in and out as he rounded the playground to chat, and he would wave to me every time he passed. Gus completed equivalent of four marathons that year, and today, as a young man and one of our coach mentors, leads play-based running games on that same yard and throughout the city with kids like him. Meeting young people where they are, providing them with a safe, nurturing, and inclusive space where their voices are always heard, where they choose what games to play, capture the flag and tag or favorites. Over the course of the seasons, children who were shy, fearful, and reserved open up as they find new friends and the courage to lead and invent games. They challenge themselves in ways they did not know were possible. Our trauma-informed socio-emotional curriculum is full of themes of the week, weaved through running games, supporting mental health, wellness, team and community spirit, leadership, and goal setting. Always beginning in a circle, providing time for people, young people to share their challenges and victories with their peers and youth development coaches who are supported with extensive trainings in trauma-informed care and self-care. We quickly pivoted our program to remote during the pandemic to support our young people in communities hardest hit by the pandemic and imp impacted by an increase in gun violence. We resumed in person with young people, including a young girl at our Queens School, who as a result of trauma began our program nonverbal, only speaking with her sister collaborating with the principal and the school psychologist to best support her. Together with her co coaches, she helped set up relays and games, and each week participated more and more with her peers and coaches. By the fifth week, she began speaking during sessions to her peers and our coaches. The school psychologist communicated to us that since she started the program, she began speaking with her peers during school. By the end of the season, she asked us if she could lead a game of tag she took her sister by the hand and another girl by the hand and started to play. Watch her playing and laughing and all the joy with the group, knowing that given a safe space, she had thrived. It is only together as a community that we can mitigate the negative impact of violence. We must partner together, guardians, coaches, teachers, social workers, principals, clinicians, NGOs, and governments, and more to establish trusting relationships that provide a positive path and mental wellness for our young people. Youth-centered programs through physical activity that meet children where they are, trained adults to identify needs, equitable access, and early intervention. Children and play go hand in hand. As Nelson Mandela eloquently said, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where there was once only despair. Thank you. And now I believe Joy from the Youth Council uh, from SNF is going to be joining us. Thank you all so much for your insight and advocacy. We really appreciate you making the time to be here. So I'd like to ask, given that media, both social media and traditional forms, so pervade our lives, what role do media representations of violence play in perpetuating the normalization of violence, especially amongst youth? Does anyone like to start? Sure. Um, well, I think that Specifically when it comes to instances of mass violence in the United States, the media 
historically have done a very good job of making mass shooters famous. Um, and I think it's time that we stop doing that. Uh, and I also... And I, I also think the media need to own up to some of the role that they've played in the perpetuation of this epidemic, too. Um, the, the, this idea that many Americans have that if you have, you know, a handgun or any gun of any sort, that you're automatically going to be a member of SEAL Team 6 is foolish and very dangerous because the gun is most likely, statistically speaking, going to be used on yourself in the form of suicide or used against you because the amount of training that it would require to actually raise the odds of survival is so much that the average person either doesn't have the money or most likely the time more than anything to do that. Um, so I think we need to start actually showing the real stories of gun violence in the, in, in the media and not just acting like everybody's going to be John Wayne all of a sudden when they have a gun. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, and I also think that it plays a role too in the normalization of violence in black and brown communities specifically where the media, you know, when March for Our Lives did our protest, we had media with us all over the ground. When the students were walking out of our schools protesting gun violence in Parkland, we were seen as courageous. We were called very kind things by the media as a predominantly white school. But when the black and brown students walked out in, in South Miami-Dade County only a month later, they were filmed from a helicopter for the most part and framed as basically rioters and delinquent children that were, you know, just not in school. And the last thing I'll say too is that uh, I think they just don't do a good enough job of telling the story of the victims and the, the toll that it really takes. And the, the, the law enforcement officers, the doctors, the first responders that have to see this every day, and the journalists themselves that have to see this every single day over and over again and acting like this is just a normal part of how our society functions and this is just how it has to be when it doesn't have to be that way. I want to echo what David said and just emphasize that we hear that response over and over again from our community partners at the Center for Gun Violence Prevention at MGH. Um, that the media gets the story wrong time and time again. And we hear this over and over again, especially from the families of victims. Um, and through the support of SNF, we have started um, a collaboration with Emerson College in Boston. Um, and we are actively designing courses for students of media um, and students to collaborate with community members who are working to prevent gun violence in systemically marginalized communities, to hear the stories of the families of victims, to hear from community partners about how to get the story right. So we're starting with young people, we're starting with students of media because the current narrative in our media gets it wrong time and time again and actually perpetuates some of the systemic violence in these marginalized communities. So I think there is hope for young people that they'll get the story right. And there's one last thing I wanted to say. I'm sorry, this is a really important point. Racism is not a mental illness. The shooter in Buffalo might have been mentally ill, but he was a white supremacist that wanted to kill black people because they were black. Yep. Hatred is not a mental illness. We need to stop just acting like white mass shooters are solely just mentally ill because they're white and start calling them what they are, terrorists. Two thirds, two thirds of gun deaths are suicides. If we want to talk about mental health, it needs to be about suicide first and foremost. And secondly, it needs to be about the mental health of black and brown children that walk often over bloodstained sidewalks on a daily basis to their schools because most shootings in the United States happen outside of school. Those kids don't get the mental health resources that Parkland got. And I'm thankful for what Parkland got. And it's not that Parkland shouldn't have got the outpouring of support that we got from the state, local, and federal government and from all of the American people. It's that every damn community, no matter what color they are, needs that same support. Thank you so much for the very thoughtful, thorough, and very passionate answers that were definitely much needed. We have time for one question from the audience. 
Does anybody have a question for our wonderful panelists here today? If you do, if you could raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. Thank you. My message is for David. Um, first and foremost, thank you. I'm, I'm an American living here now in Greece and I followed everything. That Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. I got it as soon as I could. <laughs> um, but I've been following what happened in Parkland and since Sandy Hook, um, I'm 35 and I, I remember Columbus, um, um, thank you, the Columbine High School shooting and, and feeling kind of a rever reverberation and change. And my question to you is, where do you see the most hope? And uh, obviously you're organizing from, from a Gen X perspective, which is incredible, but where do you see the most hope when there is that, there is, such a, a lack of hope when you see it time and time again from, a, from I don't want to just emphasize from the political perspective um, and, or from just a, a U.S. perspective, but where do you see the hope going? Where do you see the U.S. going? I guess if we want to say from an American perspective. Well, I, I've, I'll tell you, I'm not always hopeful, but I don't see hope as, you know, an, as a necessary thing. I could be completely hopeless as I have been many times in this work and I'm still going. And it's because I have my friends around me and it doesn't matter if we, even if we thought it was impossible, we don't care. People told us it was impossible to change gun laws in Florida after the shooting and we did as a bunch of kids who couldn't even vote yet, right? That gives me hope. What gives me hope is the fact that states like Massachusetts, although they still have an unacceptable level of gun violence, have a rate 70% lower than the rest of the country. And it's because in Massachusetts, if you want to get a gun, they have common sense, stringent laws to get one. I'm part of the shoot, I was part of the shooting club at my college, right? I went out oftentimes once or twice a week with that club shooting guns in that state. And I know there, if you want to get a gun, you need to have a thorough background check. You need to have references that say that you're going to be safe. You need to have training. And you need to renew that license to have that gun every five years for about a $100 fee. Right? Common sense solutions right there. And what brings me hope more than anything is when I talk to the people that often come up to me that hate me, or at least think they do, or they hate the image that the NRA has created of me and the movement, right? And they're screaming at me. This even happened at a shooting competition I was at, where I was in a skeet shooting competition, and the president of the club came over to me and said, why are you trying to take all of our guns? And I literally had a 12 gauge cracked over my shoulder. And I was like, are you serious right now? Um, but through that conversation, I'm like, look, I think you have some assumptions about me that aren't accurate. And I'm tired of asking you to come to me and instead I'm going to you because this isn't necessarily on all the other survivors of gun violence to do, but if this is what I have to do to get that last 10 or 15% of gun owners that are out there, that are the silent majority or the mostly silent majority to stand up to the gun lobby that does not represent what the vast majority of people who own guns want, the vast majority of young people who use guns want, which is a system, a common sense system, where in Massachusetts, is it easy to get a gun? No, but guess what? It shouldn't be. It's a gun, right? Controversial, I know. But it's things like that, talking to people that don't agree with me, that brings me the most hope, because I've had hundreds, if not thousands, of conversations where people start out screaming at me over and over again, and we find agreement to move forward. Because while they may not agree with banning assault weapons, they agree with funding more mental health programs for the two-thirds of gun deaths that are predominantly older white men with easy access to guns in the United States. They agree to funding violence intervention programs that stop kids from wanting to pick up guns in the first place. Because I hate to break it to you all, but in the United States, we can't just solely do what Australia did, not even just from a legal standpoint, but also from the fact that we have 400 plus million guns in our country. We have to talk to gunners. We have to change the culture around gun ownership in the United States and talk about not just an individual responsibility, not just locking up your guns when you're at home and keeping it away from ammunition to make sure your kids don't get a hold of it, but ensuring the collective responsibility that is enshrined in our Constitution that talks about in the preamble, ensuring the domestic tranquility, which I don't know if any of you saw that damn map, we're clearly failing to do, mm -hmm. right? But they want us to believe that gun owners and people like those on this stage are completely diametrically opposed, and we're not. The vast majority of us do agree, but the gun industry needs us to believe that we are opposed to each other because they've created an infinite money machine through these mass shootings, where they fear monger about the government taking your guns, which is never gonna happen. Literally, there are 400 million guns out there. I've never seen a single plan, ever, despite all the people that have said this, that tells me how we're gonna take 400 million guns away. And with that, they fear monger, sell more guns, results in more gun violence, and they outsource the role of the state, which is security to the individual in the name of profit and at the cost of our children. And I'm, frankly, I'm fucking done with it. Amen, thank you so much.
thank you so much to all the speakers and to all the audience. So unfortunately, that's all the time that we have today. We do have a break coming up, and you're welcome to chat and ask questions with the speakers during the break. So please give a final round of applause to our amazing panelists.